All right, yo, what is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mr. DDG94, back with another reaction video. Today, we're going to react to the rise, betrayals, and downfall of, of Saban Entertainment. For those of you that don't know what Saban Entertainment is, they are the ones that are responsible for all of the iconic 90s kid shows on Fox Kids and kids WB. They are responsible for a lot of these fucking shows. So without further ado, let's let's pay homage to the OGs on a Saturday morning. The audience wants Saban and the audience gets Saban. We do that for 40 years and then we die. The non-union studio with a legendary roster of not only cartoons, <laughs> but don't let any Saban, just like any other non-union competitor, was in on a lot of dark room deals, leaving actors and talent either without recognition, homeless, blackboard, and without compensation. So how shitty is Saban? Better yet, how good was Saban? <laughs> In his early years, was a bass player for the Lions of Judah in 1969. Their single album, Our Love's a Growing Thing, was unreleased in the UK due to financial strains. Saban travels back to Israel after the unsuccessful launch. Fast forward to the 1980s, Haim Saban would move to the United States to form his music company under Saban. America! Fuck yeah! Shuki Levi, and the duo would make music for various children's television shows such as Inspector Gadget, Dragon Quest, He-Man, Masters of the Universe, Damn. and G-Ra, Princes of Power, just to name a few. In 1983, with a few investments, would divide itself into international territory and formed Saban Paris. In 1987, Saban expanded to CBS and NBC to get into short strips such as Love on Trial and financing the movie Hidden Rage for $1.5 million. After these investments would get into three independent projects as a realized production company. Love Court would be produced with Orbis Communications as well as All American Family Challenge hosted at Six Flags for $20 million. Alfie's Hollywood Power Party and Una would be for NBC, but not realized. After these projects would then get into a relationship with this struggling company. Haim Saban would merge Deke Entertainment under Andy Hayward. Hey, After Deke fell into debt, Saban would let the company do co-productions of various shows such as Kissy Fur, Alf the Animated Series, Alf Tales, and Cam Candy. Saban and Deke would then get signed on with Nintendo of America to create and the Game Master, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, and The Legend of Zelda in 1989. This was the honeymoon phase of the relationship, but like all relationships, it would get pretty rocky in this case toxic. Because Andy Hayward was still in debt while filing lawsuits, the companies would be at each other's throats. Who gets the cut of the profits, who was in charge of productions, and whose side were you are regarding the company. This is where Deke would sue in 1987 until they reached agreements in 1991. After the settlements, the duo would do more collaborations with shows like I'm Telling, the new Archies, and Hayvern, it's Ernest. After the settlements and the messy breakup with Deke in the 1990s, would hire Edgar Sherrick and rename under Saban Entertainment Incorporated. While this happens, the company then distributes under New World Pictures. Saban then makes deals with Boabot Entertainment and Acclaim Entertainment to create video power. Fast forward strikes a deal with Prism Entertainment to create Saban Video while also getting Boabot Communications to distribute around the world in 80 Dreams in America. Deke was left behind to settle lawsuits while Saban would reach even greater heights while also getting into trouble with this move right here. reaching deals with Marvel in 1992 to produce X-Men. This winning move would then make Saban partner with Polygram Film Entertainment and the Fox Kids Network. Saban would make another power deal by purchasing the rights and adaptations to their hit show, Mighty Morphin. This was difficult for Saban at the time because of Super Sentai, the Japanese adaptation, being bought by Marvel and the Kyo Sentai Sunday and was rejected by various networks in 1986. Saban would parody Super Sentai episodes on the USA Network under Night Flight in 1987. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers would be dubbed from Kioru Sentai Zoo Ranger and would see various success in toy sales and viewership with kids under Saban. And if you value your childhood right now, you may not want to watch this next segment. You're still here? Good. I gotta get out of here! Too late! The it's Morphin time! Because of the success of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers in the 90s, watchdog groups would raise a red flag on violence it depicted, 
sounding the alarm for the FCC in 1993 as well as V-chips in various countries, leading to various channels in different countries to pull the show after its final episode, while on Fox Kids would receive an additional 20 episode order in the United States. Because Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was a non-union production under Saban, workers as well as actors were subjected to horrible working conditions, long hours, and to add insult to injury, the main rangers were aspiring actors could not afford lawyers or representatives to their name. As a result, under contracts, all episodes episodes aired new and rerun would receive no compensation to the actors and all revenue merchandise which at the time was over one billion dollars damn and royalties would go to the network and studio austin st john stated in an interview that during the production he was homeless for a time due to the non-union salary under sixty thousand dollars i could have worked and now he in fucking jail for ppp loans i believe i believe that's what it's for now he in jail for fucking ppp loans fuck jason McDonald's and probably made the same money the first season. It was disappointing. It was frustrating. It made a lot of us angry. St. John, Tui Trang, and Walter Emmanuel Jones were the first Rangers to walk off set due to low pay. While attempting to unionize, their representative failed to get a union started. Amy Jo Johnson would leave during the third season after the original cast was replaced by Steve Cardenas, Johnny Young Botch, and Karen Ashley. While David Yost, complain of not only low pay but homophobia on set during the shoot of Power Rangers Zeo. In an attempt to change his sexuality through conversion, which failed, Yas would leave the show. Corporate executives would lie on his behalf, stating that he was a difficult actor to work with, created tension with the crew and other actors, and left due to low pay. Wow. Sunday, this fall, UPN Kids is open. In 1994, Saban launched Libra Pictures while partnering with UPN Kids to launch two Saban original shows, Space Strikers and Techno Man in 1995. October 17th of 1995, Lance Robbins was made president of Motion Pictures at Saban, while on November 3rd of 1995, would partner and expand its licensing and program roster with Fox Broadcasting to build its reach worldwide. Saban and Marvel would merge with Fox Kids Network to form Fox Kids Worldwide and release The Silver Surfer as well as The YY Family, debuting to make the FCC happy and to keep Fox Kids in line with EI. Saban would then partner with Funimation to bring on Dragon Ball Z for two seasons. Saban and Ocean Productions would record voices while music composers Ron Wasserman and Jeremy Sweet who did the theme song for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, would then record the famous song, Rock the Dragon. <laughs> Funimation would dub 53 episodes of the first 67, but would cut them down. The death scenes were changed to Sent to the Next Dimension. I'm gonna take this big bully into another dimension. Don't worry about your friend. You'll be seeing him soon in the next dimension. I want them all in the next dimension. And tame certain violent scenes to make it kid friendly. September 13th of 1996, Dragon Ball Z would air in syndication, but Saban would get scared of the FCC and keep it standing with the Fox Kids Network to keep going with the initial success of the show. Pioneer Home Video would then cease production but would still release uncut versions. Saban would cancel Warner Vision and be under 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment. Captain America was to be released on Fox Kids but due to Marvel getting into debt was canceled in 1998. While on Damn. September 8th of 1998, four kids would see the success with Pokemon Indigo League on syndication then on Kids WB in 1999. To compete with the success of Pokemon, Saban dubbed Digimon Adventure thus creating the Pokemon Versus Digimon feud on the playground. And all y'all kids got jumped. All y'all kids got jumped. Fuck the Pokemon. Of Saban would not last forever, as Power Rangers was going down in popularity in the early to mid 2000s. Power Rangers Wild Force would be the last installment of the franchise in 2001. Fox Kids Network would then give over all IPs and works from the Saban Library to Buena Vista Studios, meaning work done by Saban Entertainment would not be under the Saban name. 
As a result of this, Haim Saban stepped down from the company and let Disney rename the Saban branches. Disney would then continue the Power Rangers and Digimon series dubs up until Power Rangers SPD, where the franchise would go over to Nickelodeon and would be under the Saban Capital Group, Power Rangers Productions, and Toei Animation Umbrella. Hornwicks would go under Jetix Europe, while international divisions would be divided and replaced with new presidents under Disney. Next day, I get a call and they go, well, they had a meeting with Fox and they absolutely like they went nuts over the th they're nuts they think it's the best theme ever Haim and Shuki were responsible for creating timeless theme songs for many shows but one man leveled the game up and that's Ron Wasserman working with many different actors at the time such as E.G. Daly and Lucerisa Russo with the band Betty Boop and the Beat while making hit singles such as The Fanatic Ron would find himself working for Saban filling in certain instruments in 1989 Haim would keep Ron making theme songs after the X-Men theme song was a hit for the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Ron was given a word, go, and two hours to work on the theme song. The theme was such a hit for the show, it would get even more composition and additional tracks to the Power Rangers franchise while being its own album called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Album, A Rock Adventure. A song like We Need a Hero is the saddest song ever written because prior to my time, there was always these icons that kids could look up to and that was all gone. But here's where things get dicey, because the controversy affected Ron as well. While everyone from the cast and crew would take low pay and no royalties, Ron had it just as bad. Ron would work theme songs with 80 to 90 takes. Saban would isolate Ron just to keep him away from other network executives at that time, because if Saban couldn't keep Ron, then no one could. Saban would then exclude Ron from working on the Power Rangers movie because in his own words, sorry about the film, but to be honest, you're no John Williams. That led Ron to compose cross my line and I will win as a form of getting back at Saban for excluding and gatekeeping him from future success. Saban responded by making him and Shuki creditors to his compositions. Later on in his career would be responsible for VR Troopers and Sweet Valley High. Funimation would then hire Ron to create the hint song for Dragon Ball Z, Rock the Dragon. Because Saban was scared to latch onto the show as a whole, he would take more credit for the song under Ron. After 1995, Ron would leave Saban bittersweet, citing he was tired. However, was called by Deke in 1998 to create compositions for the movie Great Expectation. In the future, Disney would call Ron later in life to go back to making theme songs for the future Power Rangers. Saban has an interesting timeline of classic shows, but let's be clear, only a few shows survived. Many went on to syndication such as Samurai Pizza Cats, Bad Dog, NASCAR Racer, Spider-Man Unlimited, just to name a few. While Saban has Power Rangers and Digimon still in its licensing under Disney, it was inevitable that today it would be owned by the mouse. Just because it was legendary considering the shows it had, we cannot look away at the treatment that the cast, crew, and musicians were given under Haim's watch. Many cite Saban just as equal to Deke in many cases. Many actors walked away from their careers due to the experience with the company. While you may think Saban is great great for theme songs and shows, we can't ignore that just like Deke, Saban got power hungry and cocky, while also being fearful of talent being more successful than him and taking more of the credit. You can say that Haim was fearful of being replaced and overshadowed. And you could be right on that. Correct! After Saban stepped down from his company, he would go on to be the 2605th star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and be worth $2.8 billion according to Forbes, while also being a contributor to the DNC. Saban will always be remembered in history as the pioneer for theme songs and TV shows, and for us 90s kids, we cannot ignore who Saban hurt over the years. But without them, there would be no Saban. Epilogue. Well, now that that's done, what is this Glitter Force thing people keep on talking to me about? <laughs>
Alrighty, anyway, so that's just gonna about do it to this one. Wow, Saban was a piece of shit. Wow, who would have thought, right? Damn, they some pieces of shit. Wow. Wow. Oh, well. Anyway, so they are iconic for the cartoons that they gave us. Spider-Man, uh, Dragon Ball Z coming to the United States. They're responsible for so many great cartoons, so many great shows such as the Power Rangers. You already know X-Men. Uh, it sucks that uh, it sucks how they treated their employees, but man, did they make some of the most iconic shit of the 90s and early 2000s, bro. Anyway, so that's just going to about do it for this one. Tell me what y'all think down in the comment section below. I'll get back to you till then. Peace out.